Hi everyone, I'm Wilson Cruz, and I just finished talking to Kara, who, by the way, used to be a therapist, and you'll believe that after this episode, because she made me go there. <laughs> Hi friends, it's Kara, welcome to the show. Today I'm talking to Wilson Cruz. Now, Wilson plays Dr. Hugh Colbert on the Paramount Plus series, Star Trek Discovery, which just kicked off a brand new season. But if you're not a Star Trekker, you may know him from the Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why, the Tony award-winning Broadway musical, Rent, or, and this is big, the ABC series, My So-Called Life, with Claire Danes. Wilson played Ricky Vasquez and became the first openly gay actor playing an openly gay role on series television. So Wilson has won oodles of awards, he served as national spokesperson for GLAAD, and he devotes a ton of time to supporting other LBGTQ organizations. And now for the backstory of today's talk, We taped our talk at the Westgate, New York Grand Central, a fabulous upscale hotel in Midtown Manhattan on East 42nd Street. I just love it here. It has a retro art deco vibe and with a major renovation last year, it's also super modern and fresh and new. They set aside a special suite for us and when my assistant Jack and I stepped out onto the enormous balcony overlooking the East River, with boats floating by, and the UN, and skyscrapers as a backdrop. We knew we had to take advantage of the beautiful day we were given, it was warm and sunny, and take this entire taping outside, right there on the balcony. So, there we are, setting up our equipment, the audio recorder and mics, naturally, plus three cameras for the videos that we produce and run on my YouTube channel, and then I get a phone call from Wilson. He was wondering where the heck we were because he could not find the hotel on West 42nd Street. Well, if you heard what I said about it being on East 42nd Street near the East River, you know that I sent him to the wrong side of town. That's right, I'd written a W for West instead of an E for East in the address. So if you're not familiar with New York, it's not that far, the two sides of town, but It can be traffic-y and it can be complicated getting from one side to the other. So long story short, Wilson raced across town and probably spent a good half hour wasting his energy traveling around New York City. So I felt bad and I expected the worst, but it wasn't the worst. Wilson totally and completely took the whole situation in stride. He brushed off the inconvenience and he settled in for a totally relaxed conversation. Now, Jack scooted down to the lobby to get him a latte, which I think perked him up a little bit. And you can see that perched on the table on the balcony if you pop over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash really famous. Um, you'll also get a fabulous look at the views we had on that gorgeous afternoon. So uh, yeah, it all went okay, and I would like to thank Wilson for that. I would also like to thank the Westgate New York Grand Central for hosting us. If you're visiting New York, it's a great choice for a hotel. It's perfectly located in Midtown, and it's just the right size. It has everything you need, plus a very personal, intimate feel. I put a link to the hotel and to my YouTube channel in today's show notes, so you can check that out whenever you like. And now, here we are. You know, I like to start talking like in the middle of a regular conversation yes. like we were just having. We were. We were getting our, our what do you call that, our, our, our feet back on the ground. <laughs> That's uh, right. Our, so we had a little... We were grounding ourselves. We had a little rocky start and I'm going to own it myself. It's a combination. But I sent Maybe. you to the wrong side of town. I mean, had I seen between first and second, that would have cued me in. But right. I didn't see that. All I saw was the actual the W. Dress. Yeah. I put the W in. You did. And it's supposed to be an it's E. It's all right. Uh, okay. We're here now when we're supposed to be. 
That's right. I wasn't and supposed to be here before that. Here's the nice thing about it is that we're outside, which we wouldn't have been. It's true. And like, we're, you'll hear some construction happening. A lot. So I decided I don't care about the noise because this is an opportunity. Like we never, did you think it was going to be, what no, is it, No, because it's been 40 for a week now. Yeah. So yes, this is the, I think this is our last day of spring. <laughs> we'll call it spring. If only our, it our was spring. And spring. Fall. I am like, I am a spring and summer person. Yeah, as am I. Like severely. And I moved to New York from so LA, so that makes a lot of sense. Why did you move to New York? Uh, to be closer to my family after the last two years where I was isolated in Toronto by myself. And I had been talking about coming back anyway, um, eventually. And when we were finally allowed to leave Toronto without quarantining for two weeks, yeah. Upon our return, um, I went down, saw my parents for a week because I had two weeks off before I had to finish the season. Um, so I went, I took a week, saw my parents, came up here for a week and saw my brother uh, and found this apartment while I was here. Oh, okay. So, so it was then meant I went to be. back to Toronto, finished the season, had the stuff shipped here, and I'm basically moved in now. Okay. Well, I need plants. You need plants? Do you keep them alive? We'll see. I can't keep a houseplant alive if my, you. if my life depended on it. Hero, thank you very much. All right, I so we're recording, it. but if you could go over to this camera and just tap on my face to make sure that it's focused on my face. Yeah. Do you see a square? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I had to have some coffee after the, today's events, so I appreciate after it. After the brutal beginning <laughs> of today. You seem like somebody who knows how to roll with the punches, even though they're aggravations. I am a, a New Yorker from, you know, originally. Right. So, so you, you grew up here. You're Puerto Rican, correct? Yes. Yes. I was born here in Brooklyn at Brooklyn Hospital. Uh -huh. uh, my parents grew up in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, before it was Greenpoint. Um, we moved to Queens, and I went to kindergarten and first grade there, and then we moved. Um, we moved to Michigan where my youngest brother was born and then we moved to California by the time I was in my late early teens um, and then I was there and then I came back here I've been I, I've lived in New York as an adult a number of times well it is the place isn't it it feels like one of my homes so does LA feel like another one? It does. It does. Yeah. I feel like I, I'm one of those people who loves them both for different reasons. Yeah. Like I have no hateration for LA. Okay. I have no hateration have. for, no, I don't. I, I feel like LA is a fantastic city. Uh, I, I feel like, especially right now, there's a, um, a real energy around LA in terms of what it wants to be there's there seems to be great potential there as a city um and some great leadership there like i'm excited that karen bass is talking about running for mayor like that might be a reason for me to go back um although i'm i'm happy eric adams uh -huh. won um but you know i was never one of these people who was like oh i hate la you know what i mean like it's pretty great it's spring most of the year you know and where else can you go from the mountains to the beach to the desert? Yeah, the landscape's you know, incredible. It's pretty crazy. But I love New York for all of the things that it makes me, right? Like it, like you said, I'm someone who rolls with the punches. I, you know, I, I will fit in in any crowd. Uh, I've lived in every borough of this, of this city. Um, Literally? I love, yeah. Staten Island? Oh, except for Staten okay. Island. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Staten Island. <laughs> it's too full. Um, I love the drive of this place. I love the culture that you can't find anybody anywhere else. Um, I love the way that people just make shit happen here. Yes. You know, um, yeah. I, I, I have that in my blood and in my, my bones. So I feel like this is home as well. Yeah. No, I, I get you know, it. I have, I'm of two minds. But, you know, I, have to, I feel like I should be here now. It's easy for me to get to Toronto from here when we work. I live a 10 minute walk to my brother and my nephew and his husband and my parents live in Orlando so I have easy access oh. to them. They'll be here next week okay. for uh, my brother's 40th and Thanksgiving. So I have a life here, you know, I have, I have people who count on me yeah. here. Yeah. 
So Orlando, have they been there a while? I lived there temporarily Ooh. too for oh, like I'm two sorry. years. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it was no, right I out like of college. Orlando. I like Orlando. I don't get me wrong. I just I couldn't live there. Yeah, they, I could live there for I think it was a year and a half maybe, and it was great at first because I'm like, this is a vacation spot. Like, why wouldn't you live where people vacation? But I that was it. I w- had had it. Yeah. It was time to move back here. My parents moved there in '97, so when I was doing rent here in New York, they moved to Orlando, and I I, I just connect those two things for some reason, but. Um, Rent in Orlando. Yeah. yeah. They went there to, to take care of my grandmother, my mom's mom, uh, as she was getting older. And then she's passed, bless her soul. Um, and they've, they're still there. Um, you know, my, I, 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 have a, I, I have a love for Orlando because, you know, it is the largest population of Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto mm-hmm. Rico. It used to be New York. Yes. Now it's So Orlando. Orlando has more Puerto Ricans than New York at this point. Yeah. That is wow. And it's all because of um, the recession during 2008, mm-hmm. you know, the economic turmoil there um, before and after the recession. Um, you know, the hurricanes uh, that have devastated the island and, uh, you know, unhoused people. Yeah. Um, so there was a real desperation that uh, of, of a population in Puerto Rico coming to the U.S. that we hadn't seen since probably like the 40s and the 50s, mm-hmm. you know, after World War II, there was a huge influx. Um, so, um, and after Korea, when my gran- where my grandfather fought. But um, you do go there and there are whole neighborhoods that feel like you're, on, you're in Puerto Rico. You go and walk into a Publix there and there's like Goya, meeting you at the door which is rare you know what i mean like anywhere else you'd be like you have to go to the ethnic aisle well Publix grocery store in orlando is an entire ethnic mm. aisle that's so interesting <laughs> so you know i mean right. it has a it, it, there was also there was also a lot of you know entertainment employment and service industry so there was a lot of opportunity there so you can understand why people would want to move there so moving on, I do have a question. It may surprise you, but it's Party of Five. Yes, nobody ever asked me about Party of Five. My favorite. The, I'm telling you that that, if I, that goes down as one of my favorite shows in history. I don't know why it hit me at a certain time in my life, I think. And it just was my show. And when I, see, mm-hmm. when I saw that you were on it, I was like, yes, yeah. yes. Party of Five. I've like named my kids after the characters. Oh my goodness. Um, not specifically like, like if you Bailey. remember. So <laughs> you have a Bailey. Almost. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm the only person who's been who was a series regular on Party of Five and My So Called Life, which for some people kind of blows their minds. Because um, they're both amazing shows. You well, mean they like, came out at the same time. They were both. Wait, these, they did. Yeah, I think they came oh. out the same season. They got saved, and we didn't. That um, is weird. That so a party five got saved when my so-called life. You yeah. just said they, because you're, you're right. Right. You well, were, I mean, at the time it was them. Yes. But um, I didn't. You know, I didn't join the cast until after I did Rent. So it was like 1999. It was their very last season. I like to kid that because um, you know Jennifer Love Hewitt left the season before the last season. Okay. And then they brought me on. So I always joke that I replaced Jennifer Love Hewitt. But the reason why I took that job. Um, was because they came to me, um, Alan Heinberg, um, who was writing at the time, came to me and, oh no, it was Alan Heinberg. Was it? Yes. Who came to me and said, you know, we want to, uh, we want to talk about how do you, how, how can you talk to a young, to a toddler, uh, and begin to talk to them about sexuality and differences in people. And so, um, that was, that was my whole entire storyline. Um, as the as the nanny mm-hmm. for Owen mm-hmm. um, was really about bullying because he got bullied, but also about how you can broach the subject of sexuality without talking about sex, which is inappropriate, uh, but use it as a lesson in how we teach difference and acceptance and diversity. What a concept, you mm-hmm. know, at the end in 1999. Yeah. So um, that was exciting to me to do. So you were and happy it was, to have that Yeah, and it was so much, it was so different from what I had just finished doing in Rent that I was like, yes, absolutely. Right. Okay, so tell me, was it like, 
would have crushed me that the set was terrible and it was like actually an awful group of people to work oh, with. No. Or are you going to tell me the opposite? And that, oh no, oh, I really loved it. It's them. just as I dreamed it would be. Well, they I don't know be. what your dream was, but I, they were very, very uh, hardworking, proud of the show. They were done. Oh, they were done. <laughs> not in a not in a bad way, but you know, you could tell that they were ready to move on to mm -hmm. something else. Um, but not without real love for for the crew and what they were able to do, but I think they just felt it. like, okay, right, this right. is the end of that book. Which is why it ended. I mean, it was ending anyway, I think so. so it was a fit, it sounds like. I think so. I also loved that that season they, they, they tried to... Um, well, they did. They fixed me up with Mitchell Anderson's character on the show, Claudia's mm -hmm. violin teacher, because he was right. gay. And um, and and the funny thing is, is that I because we're in San Francisco, uh -huh. and I remember one of my favorite lines is like, "Oh, so you're telling me that you want to fix me up with the only other gay person you know in San Francisco, right? Like I don't have a a city full of gay men." And then and then we ended up together anyway, which I loved in secrecy because Mitchell is actually a was a personal friend of mine. Okay. Um, so I'd known him for years. So you really had, though, these groundbreaking. I mean, I, I did some research looking at some previous interviews that you've had, and I feel like, you know, you, a lot of people ask you the same exact things because, <laughs> you know, for good reason, because you've had groundbreaking roles and you've been a groundbreaker and you do so much, you know, for the LGBTQ community and you always have. I and tried. it's for good reason that yep. you're asked these questions. But at the same time, I feel like, not only those questions make up you and who you are. So I'm interested in other things Please. too. So what don't people normally ask you about that you're surprised oh. that they don't? Well, party of five. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is this the first time um, in like 10 to 15 years? I can't years? even remember the last time really? somebody asked me about it. Well, because it was the last season, people forget I was even on it. Right. And there's so much more to talk about too. Right. Homeland. I'm, um, home. I'm saying Homeland. That's. I don't know. I don't know what, I, I don't know. Mm. Do people ask you about your life much? Like your personal life? Uh, yeah, I mean, they've always asked, you know, I've always talked openly about my relationship with my family in terms of coming out and their yeah. trajectory of acceptance and all of that. So I've talked about that. You know, I haven't had a partner for a decade, so there hasn't been that Wait, to really? talk about. Really? Okay. Can we talk about that? Sure. So I should warn you, I was a therapist before I did oh. this. I, I, I sensed that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to get hot here, so let me take this off. <laughs> you couldn't have timed that better. <laughs> 10 years all right let's let's go there so 10 years there's so is that a um, was that a decision you made or is that something that has ha kind of just happened so I was living here in 2010 is that right yes I was living here in 2010 and I had moved to New York to to be closer to my brother he was going through a hard time and I came here to do theater and nothing was happening. And I got this job offer to go work at GLAD. Um, and I hadn't worked a lot. I had, you know, I was going through a, a real lull in my career. Um, and GLAD came to me and they were like, well, you know, if you don't think there are enough parts for you out there, then maybe you should do something about it. And I was like, you know what, you're right. So I went to work at GLAD in order to have the difficult conversations with studios and networks about um, creating more opportunities for LGBT characters and actors on television, especially trans people of color, especially actors of color. So um, it was for the community, but in, I, I, you know, I got something out of it too, <laughs> let's be real. Yeah. Because um, there were a, a dearth of real opportunities uh, that weren't stereotypical roles. Anyway, all of that to say I was here, I went back to LA, I worked at GLAD for two years, and I s felt the clock ticking. Okay. And I s had a conversation with myself where I basically said, you know, you have all these plans to do all these amazing things. You're running out of time. Um, and so I, I put romance on the back burner because I had been in a long-term relationship that was terrible. Uh, and I just kind of focused on like, creating opportunities for myself. Um, so you're talking about work opportunities then? Yeah. Okay, so that's what you were thinking. Yeah, and so I left GLAD uh, after two years. I put myself back out there and I went right into a series with Octavia Spencer called Red Band Society and 
and then I just started working consistently, thank God. Yeah. Um, and work really took precedence. And then when Star Trek came along, which moved me to not only to another city, but to another country, um, and how much time that takes. It takes nine to 10 months to do an entire season. That's a long, long time. It is a long time. Um, and then we had a pandemic, you know? Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't hooking up during the pandemic. So suddenly I've accumulated 10 years almost. So all I, right. I've so dated. You dated. So what happened when you dated? Um, just nobody good enough to break through your other things? It just wasn't, uh, it just didn't work. Um, lovely people who actually became friends. So you dated, So because you started off by saying, I haven't had a partner in 10 years. Yeah. But you have dated, yeah. but are we talking about like one date? Um, no, I dated someone for a while in Toronto, but like a few months. And, okay. Um, and then there was someone who literally went in and extracted my heart from my chest and threw it on the floor and like crushed it. <laughs> and that was right before the pandemic. And I was like, well, I'm good for a minute. So you trusted him at first or did you kind of have a little bit of a sense of this may not? Oh, work no, out? I was. It was one of those like I'm all in. You're going to be my husband and like in my head, I'm thinking, oh, this is the person. What what happened? He had a boyfriend the whole time. Oh, no. Ta-da. So. How'd you find out? He eventually told me. Because he saw that I was getting serious, right? Uh, so he had mm. to tell me about his life. Anyway, so right. yes, I've been But single. that was tough. And then right before the pandemic, and then you're, yeah, I can only yeah. imagine all the feelings and yes at once about that but also then it's like do you trust yourself after that like well no. that's a problem yes even though of course it has nothing to do with you it has to do with him yes i mean i have to take some responsibility mm -hmm. right i let myself get there so quickly you know what i mean i i tend to lead with my heart and maybe i need to lead with my head a bit more Mm, I know, but up. I hate to say that that's a good way to go, though, because in love, you really should be leading with your heart, not your head. Right. Yep. <laughs> so you should. So you don't really want to crush that. But I know it's a it's a tough it's a balancing act, maybe a little bit of it is. It is. And, you know, I still am going back and forth between Toronto and the States. And we were locked up in Toronto this time. Right. Like there was no getting out when there was a two week quarantine. Were you, you were quarantined basically. Oh yeah, we, we could not leave. Oh, so it was a bubble. I was in a bubble of my own because we weren't allowed to um, interact with cast members outside of set because they wanted to minimize any opportunity of infection. So being the single uncle of the cast, I spent a lot of 2020, 2020 and 2021 on my own. Oh geez, so in a hotel room? No, I had an apartment. Oh. An apartment. I had a two-bedroom apartment because I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to have my parents visit at some point or my brother's going right. to come. I ended up turning it into a gym, the guest room. <laughs> That's tough, though. I mean, the pandemic was tough on everybody. Everybody but, And you also, you're something. a social person. I am. You're a love person. I am. You're a people person. I am. And that was really hard for me. It did it take a toll, like, even after? Like, did Yes. I feel I'm definitely a different social person than I was before. How? Um, I don't know. I think I, I, I'm enjoying my time at home a little too much. <laughs> like, I'm, I, you know, I'm back in New York. I have been going to the theater. I am, uh, you know, interacting with friends i keep seeing this bee what this hornet it? Oh, on your foot and I, it's on your foot oh i'm like no I, I try to just but it's is it staying with me the whole time no it's gone now. Oh, okay okay it was i didn't want it to sting your foot oh okay thanks. um and so i am reacclimating myself to being a social person okay but so you so you enjoy your downtime at home alone more so you yeah, live alone then i guess right I do. okay yeah um so i'm reacclim i'm relearning that's what I guess I should say. I'm relearning how to be in the world again. Because I had to convince myself that being alone was a good thing for a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
you know? Yes, that's a... That's the a, one thing I'm not crazy about right now is, like, going to a, a club or a bar. Like, that's that's where I, I, can, I can't... I'll go to a theater. I'll go to a, a concert. I'll go to a jazz club. Mm-hmm. I'll go to somebody's birthday party. But for some reason, I cannot bring myself to be like, ooh, ooh, back in the club. I just can't do it. Also, I'm almost 50. Maybe I shouldn't be going... <laughs> to the clubs anymore (laughs) I do find myself looking for like um, you know 90s night at some bar that I was like well maybe I'll go to that because now I go to the the club and I'm like I don't know who this is singing who is this person that sounds like the last person who was singing (laughs) it's a different world yeah I guess what I feel is I I feel like before the pandemic uh I felt part of the youth culture still. Okay. <clears throat> in a weird way. Uh-huh. And now I see, oh, I'm not really. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> you know? So it was um, a separation, a division almost. Yeah, maybe. A line was drawn without I realizing I feel like I need it. to be a, 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 um, an elder statesman, uh, you know, a supporter of, with, with some wisdom to impart to my, to my younger uh, cohorts. And maybe that's because they've been coming to me more, right? Like that I've uh, so many of younger actors and performers and people I've been in um, relation with uh, are coming to me with like questions. Like for advice? And, yeah. Okay. So this is what, like castmates and whatnot? Just in general. Just people. Yeah. In your life. For some reason people think I'm wise. <laughs> I mean, you, I'm still learning too, right? Yeah, like everybody I feel like is. I'm still like... And if you don't feel like that, what do you, you're not, then you're definitely not learning. And that we should kind of be learning our whole lives, I feel like. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. I don't ever want to get to the point where I feel like I'm I'm finished, I'm done, I know it all. I don't think I want to be around anybody who feels that way either. No. Right? Yeah, because then you're done. I'm not done. I'm so far from done. Same. So when you say you're learning how to be social again, so like what do you mean? Like what exactly, like do you feel weird around other people sometimes or do you not know how to get yourself out like what oh I think I think it's you what I think it's what what's a few people I know are also going through which is um I think I think I I'm what I think I watch myself more right like I'm because after spending so so much time alone um you, I think you end up being very self-aware, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Maybe too self-aware, mm-hmm. uh, self-conscious. Self-conscious, right. It moves from self-aware to self-conscious. Right. And I am trying to let go of some of that self-consciousness. Okay. I think I'm trying to... Uh, shed it. Shed some of that. And yeah. it, I think it was protective. Yeah. You know? Um, but I think it's a direct result of just spending nine months yeah. almost... And Every I day. think that will revert. I think that will reverse. Sure. I hope so. With, with t- over time, I think. Yes. But, but I do feel like, I think a lot of us were kind of expecting that once it ended, I mean, it hasn't ended, which is part of the problem. Yes, that is part of the problem. Right. That everybody would go like, you know, I heard a lot of people saying, oh, it's going to be the roaring 20s again. And everybody's going to want to be going at it, whatever. And I feel like maybe July was like that. A little yeah, bit. Yeah, and then we got snapped right back because right. of Delta. Yeah. Right, And then, so that was like, I actually look back on like the end of June and the beginning of July as a wonderfully free short period of time mm. where everybody had hope again. I was in Canada. So oh, okay. I, except for the two weeks that I got to come, come to the States. But it was a very different experience oh, there. Oh, okay. You know, it, they were very strict, especially in Ontario, you know, the... Basically, the only things that were open were grocery stores and gas stations oh. and dispensaries. Thank God. Um, the necessities. Yeah. Uh, so I hear what you're saying. And, you know, this is the other thing, too, is I think this is the first time I'm saying this public out loud. I was really mad at people. I was really angry. Um, I expected more of us as a as a people maybe it was just my naivete but 
I was really disappointed in the fact that people weren't getting vaccinated uh, after all of the hard work that these scientists and yes. essential workers were doing and sacrifices that people were making all around the world and we couldn't simply just get the jab. Like it was really disconcerting to me. And so, you know, that, that also, you know, also we were going through that, that election. Like I was in Toronto watching it from outside of the country watching January 6th play out in front of me, like not knowing, honestly, during, while that was happening, if I was ever gonna be able to come back to my country. Like that's how bad I thought it was. Um, and it could have been that bad. So, you know, I think all of that stuff yeah. accumulates and takes a toll. It does, it stays And you're like, with I'm you. going to keep myself safe by keeping myself separate. Right. But in the long run, that's not an answer. No. So that's why I'm reacclimating myself yes. to uh, the human race. <laughs> right. So it's less about your social circles and more about the human race that you're reacclimating yourself to. I'm really disappointed in us. It's very hard for me to grasp as well. Yeah. It seems so easy. And in crises before, before, generations before us, people pulled together. To be fair, there were always, like, you know, you look back at the Spanish flu or mm -hmm. whatever, and you see, there, whenever vaccinations came up, there was always a group that fought against it, thought it was in, in, impinging on their rights. So I guess that always happens. But to me, it just seems like one of those things where we should, all of humanity should have just come together because yeah. it wasn't even just our country. It was it the wasn't. world. No, it wasn't. And I still don't really get it. And I think, I don't know, it's a messaging or something and all of the things that are screwed up about our world right now with social media and everything yeah. else. So are you an optimist about humanity or did you used to be? Like, are you, do you think people are generally? I do, um, which is why I guess I say I was naive because I feel like I'm really disappointed because of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, also, we went through a racial reckoning. We're going through one right now. You know, the murder of Joy, George Floyd and you know, the Ahmed Arbery case is going on right now. You know, the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, case is going on right now. And I'm, I'm also disappointed in our, and where we are today in terms of that conversation, right? Like there was such potential and hope that we were arriving at a place where we could have this really difficult but necessary conversation and when it became hard people closed their eyes again and I feel like we're right back there uh, like I think the question people are asking themselves is how do we get back quote unquote to normal and it's like I don't want to go back to that I have no desire to go back to this time when we were pretending that everything was cool because it wasn't cool for, for most of us. Now, do you think that over time, this will, this whole period of time that feels just wrong and not where we should be, will somehow, because you know how sometimes you look back and you really have to be far, far in the future for change to happen. Could this just be the beginning of it happening? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I the thing that gives me the most hope is this next generation, right? That yeah. are looking at us like, what is wrong with mm -hmm, you? And mm -hmm. I'm asking the same question with, with them. Um, there's so little of what was wrong before that, that this generation is willing to accept as normal that it gives me great hope. Yeah. Um, so yes. And they see things they that do. like we never even noticed and it's yeah. like so obvious. Yes. And I think their call for truth about how we tell our history, whose history gets told, um, will pay dividends. But you know, and I hope I'm around to see it. Yeah. I think there's a great opportunity before us. I think this moment in time is fertile ground. It's up to us to water it, nurture it. I think we have a choice and I think we're in the process of making it. Mm. Very interesting. I, I do think that we have it in us yeah, yeah. to 
to yeah. make use of this moment. This and is quite a moment that we're in. It's but really, it's, I think it's oh, an interesting wow. time. Yeah. I think it is a, a crossroads. Right. There's no other way to put it. So getting down to the nitty gritty then of your day to day in this wild time and you just move. So I guess you're not in a routine yet or whatever. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm trying to create one. Yeah. You're trying to create one. So you're staying home. Are you watching TV and stuff? So I am. I'm catching up on stuff that I haven't watched. Okay, like what? I am all in on um, sex education right now. Oh, which okay. I didn't get to start watching until, not kidding you, last week. All right. So are you through it yet? No, I'm. I'm halfway through the second season. Okay. What else? Um. I'm enjoying the morning show. Uh huh. Um. That was shocking. The last episode I watched. I don't. I'm not caught up on the last one. Um, so what was the last? I watched it all in one chunk. I had like a media oh, you did? preview. So Mitch just okay. Yeah, that was <laughs> really true. I, I have mixed feelings about the morning show. Yeah, I could see that. I have mixed feelings, but I'm I'm, I'm still watching it Same. because I'm. I kept you know watching I mean? it. Yeah. it was. Yes. And I didn't love it, and I was really like, "Oh, come on!" So much of the time, and yet I just kept watching it. I yeah. did. I see. It, saw it through to the end. Yeah, I. I'm interested to see where it goes. I'm not in love with it. I am in love with Insecure, which I caught up last night. Um, I'm obsessed with that friendship. I'm also doing like Criterion Channel and like watching all of the Ilya Kazan movies I can oh, watch like it Oh, like which once. ones? Um, I watched On the Waterfront That's last week. That's maybe the best movie ever made. It was, and I remember, and I watched it and I remembered why. I was like, oh, right, this is why Right. this is a great movie. It's amazing to me to watch something like that now. Carl, but everybody talks about um, Marlon Brando in that movie. Yeah. But for me, that movie is Carl Malden. Uh, uh-huh. he, he, like, kills that film. Yes. Like, it's just, he's heart-wrenching. Sorry. No, good, all good. Um, and I guess uh, I'm going to watch East of Eden again. Because I haven't seen that oh. since high school. You know, it's funny. I feel like I started watching it like six months ago. And for some reason, I like fell asleep in it or something. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, they're hard. it's hard to watch these movies now but too, right? Because when I watched them initially, I didn't think about the fact that people of color are completely absent from yes. these films that take place in America, right? And you go back and watch these things and it's really, uh, it takes you out. It takes me out, yeah. I should say, of the experience when I'm like, Wait a minute. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Where are we? Um, It's funny because, you know, you're saying the younger generation. So I have a son who is 13. And now, so he will watch things and he will bring it all up and say, Mom, like you wouldn't believe, you know, how racist this is. Or you wouldn't believe how they portrayed this person or, you know, who played this and what they did. And it's like all, he's seeing it. Yeah. There is a, there's going to be a shift and it's going to be from the younger kids because they're just being raised that way. But you even look at the films that were like made in the the thirties, right? And like it's the middle of the great depression, but the films that were most popular were these very like outlandish gaudy films about the rich, you know, the 1% living in New York City in these penthouses that were really gorgeous in their beautiful gowns and tuxedos. Meanwhile, 80% 80% of the country was unemployed. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and like, right. <laughs> well, I guess it was, they were like, I you know, it was fantasy escapism. or something. Yeah, escapism. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, right. you know, the, the black maid would come in and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. where we are. My husband and I were in a restaurant in Miami and it's this restaurant that has some reputation. My husband was like, yeah, I heard about this place. I think they have really great crap. We should go. So for like years, we've been talking about it. And this was the perfect time we were staying close by. We're like, oh, let's just go. So we went. But like, it's just something that's taken out of a different era. They don't change anything like on the menu or the way that there are servers there who've been there for generations, probably the same old white men. And as we're there, like my husband and I are both noticing, why are all the bussers black and all the waiters are white? And I'm like, are we really in this situation right now? So we're, I was like, this is really disturbing to me. And like just the whole scene, it was like just a big turn off to me. I am Florida. really, it is, but it's Miami, which is not supposed no, to be as Florida. Yeah. Do you know? Um, okay. It's the power of nostalgia. 
I guess. And but pe- and you see people coming like, and they they like, know the maitre d or oh. something like. Oh, they come once a year or something I'm like this. I just don't even get this. Um, I don't think we're supposed. To. I don't think you and I are supposed. I to guess get not. That. But I was like, okay. And it's, it's for people who want to remember that time. I guess and live in it for yeah. a minute by going to that restaurant. Yeah. And, yeah, I really did, but it just left a bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, how is this pe- that this place? Still- and it wasn't the crab. It was. <laughs> no, the crab was fine, but I can get good crab anywhere. Right. So <laughs> I'm allergic. So oh, I you're be allergic going. to crab. Yeah. Oh, that's all all shellfish. shellfish? How'd you find out? I ate an all-you-can-eat shrimp dinner at Sizzler when I was 18, and I blew up like a blowfish. So just what? Everything? Like your eyes? I remember like it was like I was the Incredible Hulk. Like my fingers were huge. Oh, okay. Like the whole thing. I had an all-you-can-eat buffet Uh uh shrimp dinner, yeah. I got all I could eat all right. People do love their buffets, though, I must say. I don't know if they'll still be loving them after this, though interesting what Vegas does about that. Well, cruise ships also. So can I tell you that I spent the first week of March last year on a cruise, on a cruise ship? ship? Which? Uh, it was a Star Trek cruise. And it was March 1st through the 8th or something like that. And while we were on the boat, we were watching the news about the, the cruise ship in San Francisco who wasn't allowed that wasn't allowed where were, where was yours we were um, Fort Lauderdale okay around the Caribbean and back um, so it, I was a nervous wreck I was like I'm never getting off this boat you know it's probably full of COVID <laughs> so I spent most of the time in my cabin and I did you know the things I was obligated to do because I was there to work okay so nobody had it there on your ship or maybe I don't they know. Did. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't get it though. Yeah. And um, yeah. Oh, that's. But an it was nerve wracking. I imagine. Yes, and I mean, I just kept thinking we weren't going to be allowed back because that was actually happening to the cruise ship. It sure was. I felt so bad for everybody on a cruise ship. Oh my god. Oh, I don't know that I would have survived that. You're traveling tomorrow. I am. I'm going to London for a another Star Trek convention that happened really uh, last minute so okay so I'm th- excited to go but that's a good opportunity for you right yes and people there must look like it must feel good to go into a place like that where people are obsessed right well they're obsessed they're not necessarily obsessed with me but they're obsessed with the franchise uh-huh. and and the ideals of Star Trek and a lot of them um, have been watching the show you know since its inception in 1960s what is that, 62 or something? So, what, are there a lot of older people there? Well, or I'm just all? saying there's all or sorts of ages in it, but I'm saying they're, they're just not necessarily there to see So, they're just me. Trekkies. Yes. Oh, okay. Trekkers. Um, oh, Trekkers. But, but they are lovely to me, yeah, and yeah. the people who, uh, who love the show, I mean, yeah, it's very nice. Okay. Yes. So, that's a good thing, but it gets crazy before you're ready to travel, and here you are the day before you're leaving for a, what is it, a week in London. Uh, five days. Five yeah. days in London. Yeah. And here you are coming to meet me and have a conversation, and I send you to the wrong <laughs> side of town. So I forgot about it. It already. is not good. So that's why when I just said, How are you? I was thinking to myself, I was kind of just checking in and like, Oh, no, I'm fine. Are, right you, are you okay? I mean, you, it's part of living like in it. the city, right? Like, you sometimes you just you, you get lost. And right. You have to yeah. Luckily, there are cabs everywhere. I keep noticing these two guys up there on the scaffolding up at the top. Like, right. it's how many places can you be out sitting like this? Like, can we just describe this a second? Like, we have yeah. this open terrace right here. I'm watching guys over there working on a building. It's if very the, cool. If the back of the UN. The back of the UN is right there. I mean, what's the, going actually on the in there? Actually, the front of the UN. Well, I see. Right. I see the back from my apartment. But what's going on in like? Look at all those little offices in there. I know. And these, like, I'm sure there's major things going on in that building right now. I also am so I curious hope there about. Are. I hope there are well, some major things happening in that building. I have to believe there are. And then, what do you think is going on in this building? There are a lot of residents, probably. Just I'm always. You, is that a residence or is that a hotel? No, it's residents, right? I don't know. They don't all look the same to me, so I feel like all I'm noticing is that they have window air units, which yes. means no central air. No central That's air. That's unfortunate. Yeah, I could just watch people all day. Well, you know, my balcony, as I was telling you, I live in Long Island City, yeah. and faces the East River, so I just go out there and uh, and watch. Yeah, 
you know, because I can see the waterfront from from my balcony, and I can see. I have the greatest view. I have. I pay for the view. To be honest, that with you. to me is everything. I'll show it to you. After yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think my social media uh, followers are sick of me posting, you know, amazing sunsets of the New York skyline. So uh -huh. I'm going to have to taper that off at some point. Well, but also <laughs> this time of year, like. You oh know. no! There was a there was a sunset on Sunday that just took I my breath it. away. All right, so let me let me let you off the hook and wrap up for you so that you can move wrap on up. with I your feel day. Like you, did you get Did you get to ask your questions? So my, I don't really have the questions. My whole goal is really just to get to know you, and help people get to know so do you. Do I sound like a neurotic mess now? <laughs> um, I would say not to that. Well, how do you th like? Do you th do you feel like you were you? Do you feel like I am me? I just think like I've revealed how uh, how difficult these you know the the reentry into society has been yeah. for me. But that's the honest to goodness truth, and, and I, I think, think there are a lot long. of people who are going yeah. through that. Um, and I think you know, as usual, we will be saved by our young people. It's why I'm on the board of Glisten, right? Because I'm I don't have any kids of my own. So the only way that I can provide a service to, a next, to this next generation is through my nieces and nephews, my nephews and niece, I should say, and, uh, and my work with Glisten mm -hmm. because, I, you know, initially that organization was created to make LGBTQ young people safe in school, but what we've learned is that when you make a school safe for LGBTQ young people, you make it safe for everybody. Um, it's like when, when we talk about um, the work within communities of color, when you focus on how to make um, your organization or your institution reach African American women, you're also making it easier to reach everybody else. Um, so, I think this time for me has really been about what am I doing uh, to ensure that the work of making this place a more um, equitable place for all of us, that I'm doing my part, uh -huh. right? Regardless of the fact that I'm, I'm not um, putting life out into the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to yes. more than just putting life out into the world. Powerful ways. Right. And to, that's what I'm discovering. Yeah. Well, you've been doing that, though. That's nothing new for you. No. But so, I felt like, like if you I look back on your life, it's very easy. I feel like it should be very easy for you to be like, all right, I did good. Don't you think? Yes. Yes. I. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and deny that I am proud of giving voice and face to like a whole population of queer people of color who didn't have a champion for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I feel like, you know, I'm the granddaddy. There's all of these amazing people who have come after me. You know, I think about like MJ Rodriguez and Robin de Jesus and you know, Daryl Stevens, and I could go on and on and on about these people who yeah. make me proud. Like, they drive me now, right? Uh, so, I've been very fortunate. And it just builds on itself. It's like people always talk about the shoulders they're standing on from the people who paved the way before them. So, it keeps going. Amen. All right. So, did I get to know you? You did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. did I, what did I miss about you? Uh, I'm actually a lot of fun. I don't know that I sounded fun on here, but <laughs> I got so serious. I get it from you no matter what. I get the fun vibe from you no matter what. But sometimes it's easy just to be fun and whatever. And then you don't really get to know a person because it's not, it's like a little superficial. You know what yeah. I mean? So I like fun as much as the next guy. I get the fun vibe from you anyway. You didn't have to prove it to me. You have both. You have fun and you have depth and yeah. seriousness. Like that's life. It's all of it wrapped up. And that's the beauty of it, I think. Yeah, I just think it's this, it's, I think we got a good, uh, a good uh, slice of what this moment in time yes, is. Yes, for sure. And it is a moment in time. Yeah. So we'll check in with each other. I would love that. In a year or something. Okay. 
Same and then bat we'll time, see. same bat channel. I'll be back. I'll be here. Uh, will I be here? You might have to come to Toronto. Oh, okay. I'll come to Toronto. I'm game for that. Yeah. Come to the spaceship. Okay. I'll come to the spaceship. It's crazy. I mean, we really didn't talk about Star Trek. We really didn't talk about my so-called life. Um, but I feel like all your other interviews talk about it. So We have time. What do you want to know? What time is it? It's only 2.30. Are you want to talk about the shows? Sure. I know, but I don't want to ask you this. I don't want you to say the same things that you've told everybody else. So you have to tell me something completely different. Okay about my so-called life and but I that's need gonna to be know, hard because I feel like I've talked about you, that that's what my I'm doing. whole you've life. Said, I know you've talked about your whole life so we need to talk instead about um, what aspect of it. Okay, how about did you watch Homeland? After. I didn't. <gasps> oh, have you been asked that before? I haven't. Um, Why not? Ugh. Um, there was a moment when I was going to be on Homeland and it didn't happen for some reason. Um, and then I just got really petty and I didn't watch. <laughs> and then so many years passed that I, I just didn't, I didn't watch. And I love her and she knows this. This is not a secret that she's going to hear. Like if she listens to this, um, we've talked about it, but, um, wait, wait, okay. So it was the first season you were supposed to be in. It was the very first. Who season. were you going to be? Do you know? It was this person who, um, that she trusted, I'm trying to remember back, that, there, that she trusted who ended up um, double crossing her. Okay. It, it was someone that was like a friend of hers and was a partner maybe to her. So did you talk to her about mm -mm. this before? So she didn't even, okay, so you were not in touch at that mm -mm. point. And you were like, oh, I'm scoring a role. Mm -hmm. But was it, but it was, it was first season you said, so did, was it already, so. it was already wrapped? Like you didn't, it wasn't big yet? You know what no. I mean? So, but you knew it was just a show called Homeland. Yeah. And then you didn't get it and then it came out and you were like, ugh, can't do it. Um, yeah, but now, you know, now I have all of these seasons to catch up right, on, right? right? Like I can binge it. But also it was like in your face all the time because it was such a all big show. All the time. So it's like there's constant And I never had any doubt that she was brilliant in it because she's brilliant yeah. in everything. Uh -huh. Like she's, she was the first um, like genius I ever met. Oh, like a real life genius. I feel like she's an, oh. I think, she, I feel like she's an, an uh, as, a, as an actress that she's genius. I really do. I think very few. Pe I think that of very few people, but s there was something. There is something very. Um, like she can't even. She doesn't even know. Uh huh. She doesn't even know what she has, right? She like just it's has just. It and it's does just it. her. It's just part of who she is. Like she has. It's all so very accessible to her, and um, I have to work on it, right? Uh -huh. Like I, I, I. I spend a lot of time on my material. I feel like she does too, of course, but she has access a lot faster. Got it. I just think it's genius. It's genius. So you don't think it's emotional, some sort of emotional thing? I feel like when you're doing that at 13, uh -huh. which is what she was doing at 13. Oh, so you saw it back then, right? Well, obviously that's when you worked with her. She was 13 when we made the pilot. Wow. And I, rem and I was 19 and I remember thinking, this person is an alien. <laughs> wow, and that that makes sense because she was insanely good. She was thirteen playing fifteen. Like they were asking her to imagine, right, and play things that she hadn't even done. She's talked about this. Her first kiss was with Jared Leto. That's right. I did. That's right. I did hear right? him say and that. And you watch that scene, and she allows herself all of that, and she shares it with all of us. Mm. Could you imagine if your first kiss was with a heartthrob like Jared Leto and they were filming it? No way. How many people would allow themselves to be seen in that way? Yeah, especially at that age at when that you're age. so vulnerable. That's what I'm talking about. Jeez. That's why it's genius. You're going to be blown away by her when you watch Homeland. Oh, I... It's really... No doubt. I mean, she's really good. I mean, the whole show... You, are you gonna, I have to tell you, you're <laughs> going to have to watch it now. I'm to, like giving you homework that you have to watch Homeland. I love that you, watch, that you asked that. Um, so anyway. I'm glad that I asked you that because I, again, I, you know, I don't like to ask you the same things that I know that you've answered a million times, but I'm surprised nobody's asked you that Yeah. because I would have thought it was yes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, but no, no. And I didn't have showtime either for a long time. Oh, uh, okay. Remember as would be for streaming. Yeah. Like, yeah. You had to have it. Right. No, <laughs> you had to buy DVD it. Right. Or right. It was definitely a thing, a separate thing that you got on, well, on your regular TV or whatever. And I was poor. So I guess you didn't watch Dexter <laughs> then either at that time. I did not watch Dexter. Dexter's back now. I know. 
I know. I did not watch Dexter. Um, Dexter was good, I have to say. Or Six Feet Under, you did not watch then? Six Feet Under was on HBO. Oh, wait, that was HBO. That's right. And I watched every moment of that. Okay, that too is really a good show. That season finale is the best hour of television in the history of television. I've mentioned this before on the show because that's a fact. It's a fact. That when you come... Now, I'm going to give you another best finale. So I have two. One is Six Feet Under Mm -hmm. and the other is The Americans. Did you watch it? I didn't finish The Americans. Why not? I need to finish it. I just, you know, you just... I think I got... How many seasons were there? So you stopped in season three, I'll bet. There were five, I think. I think I got through season four and then I just haven't done five yet. I'm surprised because it got... I think I started to get busy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I'm telling you. That's why I'm watching stuff now. Yeah. Uh, Because I I catch up on stuff. So I think what you're going to do, I'm going to give you a little menu of what you're going to do. So you're going to watch, you're going to finish The Americans, but you're going to have to recap yourself. Okay. Remember everything. And then you're going to go start Homeland right after that. Okay. And... This is my this is my prescription. And you're gonna get over it. You're gonna get over the fact that you didn't get the role because Oh no, you I'm did. over it. I'm I know, totally I'm <laughs> joking. I'm totally kidding. I know you got over it. I was it. bad though at the time. I was like Of course. Fuck I needed that job. But I mean <laughs> <laughs> But you would have probably been killed off early on anyway. Most That's people not, were. I, mean, I get do you understand who you're talking to? I die in everything. People love to see me die. <laughs> I died in Rent. I died on Ally McBeal. I died in Supernova. I died in Star Trek Discovery. Wait, I don't remember. I watched Ally McBeal too, but I don't remember. Who were you on Ally McBeal? I don't really talk about it a lot because it's not a role that I would play today, but oh. I played a trans um, prostitute on Ally McBeal oh, okay. the very first season. Here's something that people don't know. All right. I, um, I filmed that episode while playing Angel in Rent in Los Angeles. Wow. So I would spend, it took two weeks to do the episode be, because it was a it was pretty uh, dramatic episode for that for them, that season, especially their first season. And I played this prostitute that Allie kind of takes under her wing. And you think for most of that episode that this is a new character on the show. Um, and then they kill her. Oh. But people really got attached to this person, I have to tell you. They got really attached to this character. Like, it was devastating for people. Like, I still hear about it. Oh, my God. So it really resonated. It did. So it should... It was really moving to me, but, oh, yeah. But you wouldn't play that character today. No, because we need to have trans people playing those characters, right? Like, I can try and understand. I did the best I could to understand uh-huh. what that is, to feel gender dysphoria, to... Um, I think, I, I mean, and, and I was clearly successful at it, but I, I think if a trans person had played that role, they would have brought their lived experience to that. That would have been different and probably more in tune with the actual experience. All right, so that tells me there needs to be more characters like that. Yes. For people to give you the feedback that they have for the yes. one ep- episode. For sure. How about Grey's Anatomy? Oh, I loved that. Every time I think about that job, I think about the fact that I've been in this industry for almost 30 years. And I, I tell you, there are people who will, always, who will come up to you and be like, we're going to work together one day. And we never do. I can give you names of people that I won't. But, you know, but, oh, Wilson, you and I are going to work together. And it's been 30 years. I haven't heard. So we're you. talking about like producers, directors, yeah, that type? Right. Okay. Um, Shonda Rhimes, I met uh, a couple years before that episode. Um, and she was like, you're going to be on Grey's. I need you on Grey's. And, I was, and you know, I was so jaded at that point. I was uh-huh. like, thank you. <laughs> Two years later. She remembered. Phone rings. I wrote something for you. Um, and I got word, like, really quick. It, you know, I didn't have a lot of notice. I showed up, and there was this beautiful monologue about this man who had worked his whole life for the right to marry his partner. And it had a, a funny tilt to it as well. Um, and I got to work with one of my favorite actors of all time, which is Sada Ramirez, um, who's a friend of mine. Um, and we got to share that really beautiful scene together. That's very cool. That's a great story. It's a great story. That it says a lot about Shonda Rhimes. Yeah, that yeah. is interesting. So you, so in Hollywood, basically, you've, you've heard a lot. People say a lot. Mm. People tell you a lot. Mm. 
but you're still an optimist about people. Yes. Even though they don't always come through with what they promise. Yeah, because I think, I honestly think people are doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. Even in terms of this vaccination, I still think people are doing the best they can. I just wish we weren't dictated by fear so much. But um, I do think that people are good at the at their at their at foundation. Their core. Mm -hmm. I do so. So you'll look into this here camera, mm. and uh, you say, "Hi, I'm Wilson Cruz. I just talked to Kara, or something like that." And then you can say anything you want. We'll do two. So one will just kind of be a social media teaser. Okay. And or I might put it at the beginning of the episode, not to put too much pressure on you. And then after... I may have heard a few episodes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wait. Hold on. Back up. I need to have your feedback on that. It was great. That's why I'm here. Who did you listen to or, or uh, watch? I listened, I listened and watched Josh Radner. Okay. Because I feel like he's awesome. Um, who else did I listen to? Oh, the Tippy Hedren episode, because oh, I thought tippy. that would have been fascinating, and it was. I really, that was one of my pinch me moments. I bet. That yeah. sounded like it, too. It was. Yeah. I was like, what? I was at Shambhala. Her, I went to her house, which is on this wildlife preserve, and yes. I'm like, there's little Tippy Hedren right in front of me. She was adorable. Yes. And she did not mind saying the same stories about Hitchcock it was over a and great, over again. It was a great episode. So thank you. So, um, yes. anyway. okay, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> so right, so I often decide later like what to put at the beginning of the episode, but you have no okay, so and Tippy, oh my god, Tippy gave me one of the best actually the so I do a guest testimonial also and I put them on my website or sometimes they go on a little highlight reel. You know, I just talked to Kara and then she went on and on for like five minutes. I was like <laughs> I couldn't believe all the things she was saying. She's like, oh, I feel like we could be best buddies now. Oh. And I was like, oh, wow, Tippy Hedren. <laughs> no pressure. First, I'm going to make you go to the west side before the east side, and then I'm going <laughs> to tell you about Tippy Hedren's better than life, bigger than life. <laughs> so first one is just anything for social media that you think people will um, maybe like be interested in checking out the show. Okay. So... Whenever you're ready, whatever you want to say. Hi, everyone. I'm Wilson Cruz, and I just finished talking to Kara, who, by the way, used to be a therapist. And you'll believe that after this episode, because she made me go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yes right there. Perfect. Well done. Well done. That was Wilson Cruz. Thanks for hanging out with us. Check us out on YouTube. Visit the Westgate for your New York City travel plans, and please stay tuned for more new talks, some of which were also taped at the Westgate. I'm Kara. This is Really Famous. I'll talk to you soon.